GLP-1s and fertility. What does the data show and can they help you? Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI, so I'm a fertility doctor. And I am here to answer all of your fertility questions and help you learn more about your body, health, hormones, and your fertility. Today, I'm diving in to GLP-1s, what they are, how they can help, and what their role may be in reproduction. I am pulling a lot of what we're talking about from a study that will be linked in the show notes. And so this was published in Human Reproduction Update, which is a very reputable journal. And it says the role of glucagon-like peptide one in reproduction from physiology to therapeutic perspective. So first of all, what is GLP-1? And what are GLP-1 receptor agonists? So the medications that we think of when people are saying GLP-1, what we're really talking about are medications that act like glucagon-like peptide 1. And so they are making your body act like it has more of GLP-1. What GLP-1 is, is it is something that is made in the intestines. And so when you eat food, it's giving a signal that your body has had enough food and to start the metabolic process needed to digest that food. So it all originates in the intestinal tract. Now, what was once solely thought of as a treatment for diabetes to try to help with insulin resistance and blood sugar regulation has now been seen to have many different effects. And I think what we're really seeing here is similar to this other video where I talk about your gut and your fertility, that the gut really is important in a lot of how your body processes things. It's your first line of defense. It allows different nutrients in, but also exposure to other things. And your gut brain have their own access where there's so many neurons going from the intestine to the brain and communicating. And that leads to the point that there are receptors for GLP-1 in many different tissue around your body. So of course, the stomach and intestines, but also the pancreas, the lungs, the brain, and even in ovaries, testes, and uterus. So there are receptors for that GLP-1 really throughout your body. Obviously, what we see in popular media right now is that people who are using GLP-1s, these are medications like Ozempic, Wagovi, Trizepatide, are losing weight. And so why are they losing weight? One of the reasons is because their body is recognizing that they are full at a much lower level of eating. So their hunger signal is going down. In addition to changing how your body metabolizes and its response to food. So it is improving your insulin sensitivity, essentially making you metabolically respond in a more appropriate way. Therefore, you're not eating as much, you're losing weight. There's been a camp of people who've argued for a long time that all the benefits to fertility are because you are losing weight. And I think this is one of those places where we've got a two things can be true at the same time. Yes, if you are overweight and you lose weight, that is going to have its own set of benefits. If you have PCOS and can improve some of the hormonal signaling, that has benefits. But I think the GLP-1s have a purpose and a role in certain groups of people outside of just losing weight. And so to just be dismissive and say, well, the only benefit is for weight loss might be a little short-sighted. Although to be really realistic, the added benefit from somebody who is overweight and also has metabolic changes is probably doubly helpful because weight loss itself is so impactful on your health. Well, what we know is that when you have more GLP-1, it's going to impact, we're going to start the brain to start with. If you remember how the menstrual cycle works, we always talk about the HPO axis. So the hypothalamus, pituitary gland, and the ovary. So in a normal month, you're going to have a group of eggs available in the ovary. I always like to imagine these eggs come out of a vault from within the ovary. And then each egg grows inside a follicle. Well, what's going to happen is the brain, the hypothalamus actually sends out a signal to the pituitary gland called GnRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone. Well named because the gonadotropins are the hormones that work on the gonads. So this is FSH and LH, and those are stored in the pituitary gland. So when the brain sees that there's no egg growing, usually that's by a low estrogen signal, the hypothalamus sends out GnRH and GnRH tells the brain, hey, let's send out FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. We want to get a follicle to grow. FSH comes to the ovary, gets that follicle to grow, and that follicle is making estrogen. Estrogen is talking back to the brain saying, I don't need more FSH, I'm growing. 
And then when that estrogen gets to a peak level, it's telling the brain, hey, send out LH so I can ovulate. The hypothalamus sends out a different amplitude and pulse of GnRH, it's really like Morse code, to then tell the pituitary gland, let's send out a huge amount of LH to get this follicle to rupture and allow the egg to be released for ovulation. So this is a delicate balance between the brain being able to interpret the signals the ovary is sending, the hypothalamus, the pituitary communicating, and the ovary being able to respond. Different things can impact the signaling pathway. So having inflammation, having obesity, if you're overweight, your fat cells can make a different type of estrogen. The brain gets confused and hears this moderately elevated estrogen level, not super high, but enough so that it doesn't really know that a follicle isn't growing. And that is going to blunt the response of FSH and LH being sent out. Suddenly when you lose weight and that estrogen goes away, the brain can now sense that there's no egg and it can send out a stronger signal. So weight loss is important in part of this process. Similarly with PCOS. When you have PCOS, I like to think about it as a having too many eggs come out of the vault. And when you have a lot of eggs come out of the vault, each little egg is making a tiny amount of estrogen and the same problem happens. They are all talking back to the brain, elevating that baseline estrogen so the brain doesn't really know that an egg isn't growing. It's not sending out enough FSH. The FSH is getting diluted amongst all the follicles. Ovary gets really bored and the pathway from LH to make androgens like testosterone starts to become more predominant. And that's why in PCOS, you have irregular cycles because of this brain ovary mismatch, but you're also going to have these androgen symptoms like hair growth and acne and things that really are not fun. Well, these problems have a similar origin, but they're different, meaning you can have PCOS and be underweight or overweight. You can have obesity and not have PCOS, but because they have a similar mechanism, they often are categorized together, especially in studies. Well, GLP-1 does have receptors in the brain. And what we know is that it impacts the ability of the brain to send out GnRH. So you see improved GnRH sensitivity and release with GLP-1, and the brain can send out a better signal of your gonadotropins. Well, that's excellent. That's the first step of downstream talking. Well, in the ovaries, we actually see a decrease in androgen production from GLP-1s. So you see a decrease in that testosterone, that androstenedione dione production. You see an increase in sex hormone binding globulin, and you see that the body can actually reverse some of this PCOS, meaning you start to respond better and ovulate. So that means we see improved ovulation rates in the presence of GLP-1 because there's better brain ovary communication. It appears that in both the ovaries and the uterus, there are additional properties of the GLP-1 besides just some of the metabolic changes. So I think what you're hearing is that GLP-1 can directly impact tissues. There can be some benefit from weight loss. There can be some benefit from metabolic changes, but also there is organ change, meaning in the ovaries and in the uterus, you can see a drop in inflammation and in fibrosis. And what we know is that inflammation is toxic to the reproductive system. It definitely interferes with hormone communication and production. It is harder for an embryo to implant with inflammation. And then fibrosis is a huge issue, especially as tissues start getting older. We see ovarian fibrosis as we start to have older age and we start to get to a place where it's harder for our ovaries to respond to those normal signals. So yes, some of the decrease in inflammation on your whole body, if I go check some of your systemic inflammatory levels, might be because of weight loss or improved insulin sensitivity and better processing of some of your hormones. But on a direct organ level, we're also seeing improvement in inflammation at that tissue level as well. And I think that is the area that has the most interest to me. When it comes to pregnancy studies, what exists out there? I think it's important to note that all the studies that are reviewed have to do with patients who have PCOS, diabetes, or are overweight. Most studies have shown either no change on your fertility, or they might have improved ovulation, improved menstrual regularity, or had an improvement in natural pregnancy rates and pregnancy rates with IVF in a very small study. Those pregnancy rate studies were quite small. You should also note that right now the recommendation is to stop any GLP-1 two months before you get pregnant. So if you're going through fertility treatments, you're going to see us pull that off before we're going to do a pregnancy cycle. We also say that we want you off of it for about a week before you undergo any type of anesthesia. That is because of how it slows down that gastric motility. You're at an increase for aspiration and we don't want that. So if you are going through IVF, maybe you're not getting pregnant yet, but you're banking some embryos, 
you can stay on your GLP-1. We're just going to have you stop about a week before that egg retrieval, and then you can get started back again. Although there is limited data, when we look at the very latest data, which is from 2024 on pregnancy exposure, it appears that there's no increase in birth defects, no increase in pregnancy loss, or no increase in need for pregnancy termination for any abnormalities for women who are on GLP-1. So that is reassuring data, although the recommendation right now still is to stop the medication before conceiving. How can GLP-1s help with fertility? I really see that there's two main ways. Number one is going to be this stimulatory, this upregulation of the HPO axis. So there's improved sensitivity there. And the secondary way is going to be through inflammation and decrease in inflammation, both systemically, maybe it's from metabolic changes like insulin sensitivity, and then also directly at an organ level. I think there's definitely a role for this when it comes to women who are overweight or have PCOS or diabetes and wanting to get pregnant, even if it's pre-treatment before doing IVF, especially if you've had prior poor outcomes in the past, that is something that I might consider. Where do we not know how this might benefit women with other autoimmune diseases or unexplained infertility? I think it's easy to argue that if you're overweight and have any of those, it might be worth trying to see if you can get that dual benefit because we know weight loss will give some benefit. But could that inflammation component be advantageous? Hypothetically, I think yes, although we're going to have to admit that there's not data on that exactly. I think this is an exciting area for us of research and definitely something that we can start to think about in patients who might be having a harder time getting pregnant and want options. I will link the study below and as always ask questions, please subscribe and share. That's how this channel grows and you can get more information on the As Woman podcast or over on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD. Thanks friends.